Hello and welcome to the newly renamed Zero and Wizards Movie Club. That's right, it only took us one episode to rename this. So, I'm actually quite proud of that. I am the Wiz. I'm Zero. Zero, how does it feel to have an official name? Kind of nice. Kinda yeah, it's nice, <laughs> you know, it feels official. We're all on the same page. It's great. Okay, so, last week... Uh, you decided through a whole maze of obfuscation that we are going to be, well, it was really my decision, but you kind of helped, that we are going to watch Wes Anderson's newest film, the 2021 movie, The French Dispatch. Uh, I'm very familiar with Wes Anderson. You're not so much. So I think I'd be really interested to hear what you think of The French Dispatch. Um, it was kind of a neat film, uh, especially since um, it wasn't a just straight out film um, over the time duration. It was more like um, three short stories and then sort of a small epilogue at the end. Mm. Right. And that that's not a, a normal thing that Wes Anderson does. He usually does a straight narrative from beginning to end. So that when I realized that was that was the 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 conceit of the movie i was kind of surprised uh I, it also surprised me by what the the object the, the not the objective the uh the stance they were going towards uh when it came to the movie itself i was very surprised that they were looking at everything from a a journalist point of view which uh, if no one knows, of course, but I used to be a journalist and I used to want to be a, a professional journalist. So this spoke to me in a different way when I was watching this. Um, yeah, and all three stories are good. All three stories are uh, solid. I have my favorites. I have ones that I have one that I'm eh about, and I have one that's a favorite of mine. But these are solid stories that are being that are being shown. In this movie, um, Wes Anderson has had a lot of success in writing movies. He's gotten nominated for best screenplay a couple of times on the Oscars. Uh, if I look back at his filmography, I think it's the Grand Budapest Hotel, and oh yeah, he also got nominated twice for. Uh, Best animated feature. So he he's he is a celebrated movie director uh, when it comes to people when it comes to Hollywood. So he 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 has he, he is popular among Hollywood, but he has a distinct style. I have to ask, what did you think of the style and the visual presentation of the movie? Um, it was really interesting because um, each story seemed to have um, sort of a different way of presenting itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, which I thought was kind of, uh, kind of interesting, um, especially uh, the third story because the third story you had animation being thrown into the mix, which was, which was kind of an interesting uh, design choice. I was just like, oh, I uh, didn't expect to see any animation in this, and here we are. Yes, and uh, the way that uh, in the movie they use color, and they it's the movie. I wouldn't say it's mostly black and white, but it's muted colors they use a lot of in it. But when they use color, it actually kind of means something in the movie, which, especially I think in the first part, was really important to get some of the uh, points across in the movie. Um, what was what was your favorite story? I mean, there's three. the The way the movie goes is that there's a journalist covering three stories, uh, three different stories. Uh, the first one is about art, the second one is about politics, and the third one is about true crime. And it's done in a way that reminded me strongly of The New Yorker, which is a intellectual, long-form, uh, journalistic kind of uh, storytelling. Uh, I, I wonder what your fa which one was your favorite story, and when we get the spoilers, we'll go into detail as to why. Um... Actually, um, as odd as it is, um, I actually quite like the first one a lot. Okay. I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, to pre to prelude uh, the whole uh, piece about the three stories, um, 
the uh, the movie does introduce that um, there's a reason behind these these three stories and everything, and um, we'll get to that in spoil in the spoiler zone. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, just it it was just kind of neat just being presented um, with with the premise that hey, these are these are about three stories from um, from this uh, foreign bureau uh, publication and everything, and it was actually kind of funny that you mentioned the New Yorker, but um that's uh there's a reason for that uh at least from what i can tell but i'll talk about that once we get into the spoiler zone area of, of this podcast i kind of well i i kind of um after i watched the movie because i was i was really feeling the new yorker vibes in this i was like this really feels like the new yorker to me so i looked it up after the movie and yeah and this isn't a spoiler at all but um, Wes Anderson has said that his direct uh, inspiration to the movie was reading New Yorker and was and was emulating their style to a point. So, it, yeah, and even more so um, towards the end credits because the end credits uh, go through a bunch of covers of um, the French Dispatch, mm-hmm. and all the covers are very much styled in in like the vintage style of old New Yorker covers. Yes. Absolutely. Are you familiar with the New Yorker? Um, I am aware about it, and I've seen some of the covers um, every once in a while when um, they put out like an issue that's kind of poignant and on the nose to something within the current event space. But mm-hmm. um, not really super in tune with it. Mm, okay. I mean, I I've read a few pieces like way back in the day, and but they are intellectually dense and. They're enjoyable, but I kind of felt like I had to have a thesaurus with me at times in order to read it because of how, uh, I, I guess, the the plain way of saying it, the type of words and sentence structure that they use. So that's why it, like, it kind of hit me when I was watching the movies, like, this really feels like The New Yorker. But I don't think it's something that would alienate some people if they... If they were to watch this and see, oh, this is really frou frou and very, um, what's the word? Um, I guess stodgy in a way. I guess is the best way I can come up with right now. Just, uh, I, I think for like someone, not that someone with a limited vocabulary, but a, not a robust vocabulary. I don't think they'd have a problem watching this movie and enjoying it. Yeah. Yeah, um, it it doesn't really get too flowery in the vocabulary for the movie. So yeah, just um, I would probably agree that anyone with um, maybe a limited um, a limited vocabulary can still enjoy the movie and everything. Yeah. So okay, performance wise, I think Jeffrey Wright is the best performance of the movie. I think it's really going to depend on what you like and which story you like the most, but. Uh, Jeffrey Wright, Leah Sado, and Benicio del Toro are my three favorite performances. Um, they are uh, Jeffrey Wright is the journalist in the third story. Leah Sado is the the guard, the female guard in the first story, and Benicio del Toro is the artist in the first story. Yeah, um, I was particularly drawn to Jeffrey Wright, um, yes. mostly because just um, his narration. Uh, or the rather the voice that he has for narration is mm. just so so pleasant oh. and it was kind of funny because i was just like like oh my god why why does he sound so familiar and then it turns out that um he also plays um uh plays some parts that come up to recent mind um the biggest one being uh oh god um, uh, Felix Leiter from the more recent Westworld? Uh, James Bond uh, film. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, of course. I, I forget that he's Felix in that. Honestly, just um, it was just kind of it was just kind of neat to just hear his nar- narration in, in the third story because just just um, he's just got such a pleasant voice about it. And uh, and it was just sort of neat uh, seeing his and uh, the performances that he would kind of put in some of the some of the parts of the story while he's narrating through and everything. Mm-hmm. So yeah, just overall a lot of, a lot of fun uh, with the third story, especially with him being the narrator. Right. And yeah, like, like you said, his voice is so good and it fits the dialogue so well. 
uh, with Anderson's dialogue so well that it it really elevates the story uh, that is being told in that section. And I've been a fan of Jeffrey Wrights for a long time. Uh, the first movie I remember watching him in was the remake of Shaft, the, the first remake. I don't know if you've seen the, the remake of Shaft with Samuel L. Jackson. I uh, have not. Okay, he played the villain. He played a uh, he played a, a, a I think it was a drug dealer in the movie, and he he of course he acted his ass off and he chewed scenery, but he was really good in it. And then he did uh, an HBO film called uh, God, what is it called? Oh, he he did an HBO film that was really good, um, but he's also been in Westworld. Uh, he he is an, a criminally underrated actor, and when he gets to get good roles and good dialogue he's really good and this movie really shows that he is an underutilized actor i think uh, now he is jim gordon in the batman i think is his newest role yep yeah. because um uh, i was uh, i had started up the batman last night since i was like oh yeah i've been meaning to watch this and i was just like oh my god it's jeffrey wright yeah <laughs> um Let's talk about the uh, okay. Uh, what were your favorite? Your favorite performance was Jeffrey Wright. You, you're saying, yeah, mostly because just the narration just kind of pulled together the uh, the true crime uh, journalism story together so well. One of my favorite actresses of all time is Frances McDormand, and I was sad to see that she was kind of underutilized in this. Uh, she was the reporter in the second story. I think the second story is the weakest of the three. But it's good, but I think they, uh, how to put this, there wasn't really a strong character behind the journalist in the second one. It was clearly a story about you know, the revolutionaries and, and the, the student revolutionaries, but it felt like the, the journalist was just inserted in incorrectly into the, uh, into the into the story itself whereas in the other two either they're not in it at all or they just so happen to be a part of it and they're written well into it that it makes this piece more compelling the second one felt off to me so that's why i kind of i kind of went out of that one it's it's good but it's not as good as the other two yeah, and I can definitely agree because um, for the first story, uh, just the the writer uh, the writer sort of um, comes off as sort of a silent a silent observer, just someone who's just chronicling the events that that transpired uh, behind the entire story, mm -hmm. and then um, uh, whereas the third story, uh, the writer was actively part of the events that happened, so. So it just felt like uh, sort of seeing seeing the story being retold from from the from the writer's direct point of view and everything. Um, and then the second one, yeah, it it just it just didn't feel there because just um, the reporter for that one uh, kept kept trying to insist that that they were trying to um, maintain journalistic neutrality, but. Yeah. At the same time, just, just, there were just events where she was j j sort of directly involved in it, and, and it sort of, I guess, um, knocked the storytelling uh, off kilter a bit. Uh, I don't know. At least that's kind of how I felt about the, it. It, it kind of seemed like it was a criticism of, I, I, I normally hate doing this because I, I, uh, when I analyze film, I kind of hate talking about it because I don't want it to make it seem like if you don't agree with me, you're watching it wrong. So please don't take it that way. Uh, you especially, Zero. But the way I, I, I took it was that the story was supposed to be a criticism of journalistic neutrality and how precarious and maybe how pointless it is when it comes to politics, which to me, I which the concept itself I don't agree with. But... I think that was the point of the story, that it, it's kind of pointless to be that way. 
but it didn't come off very well. It didn't come off right. So the 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 message kind of got muddled in the story. D- do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, and um, I can definitely see that um, as being as being a valid criticism as well too. Just it seemed like that they had they had an idea that they're going to go with, and then it's kind of like you mentioned, just they sort of dropped the ball on it. Yeah. Um. Okay, I think the strongest one is the third part, and I, and the the animation surprised me, but I, I kind of understand why it was done. Maybe for budgetary reasons, but to, but the way it was done was also kind of just it. It was kind of well done in a way, because the minute I saw the animation, it was oh, they kind of ran out of budget space, didn't they? And then I looked at it, I was like, no, nah, this actually looks pretty good. So maybe not. Maybe this was a, a conscious artistic decision. So it, it just the, to accentuate maybe the ridiculousness of the situation. So I, I definitely enjoyed that. Uh, that could have um, hurt the story in a way. Because it, it was dealing in kind of a, a serious situation. But... Like a lot of Wes Anderson films, it takes serious situations and kind of makes it silly to a point. So I, I enjoyed it. I, I thought it was uh, I, the third part was very well done in all of it, with all of what it did. And I yeah. know you. Oh, go ahead. Um. Yeah. And um. To your point about the animation feeling kind of silly, um, but yet not feeling completely out of place. Um. I'm definitely inclined to agree on that because just, um. Uh, for a second, uh, when they start the animation, I'm just like, "Whoa, what in the world happened here?" And then, then it kind of goes back to the live action sequence, and I think it gets to one sequence where where they go from live action to animation for a bit, and then the animation just perfectly loops back into the live action. Yeah, and I was like, "Okay, that's actually kind of neat." <laughs> yeah, yeah, and the, the and <laughs> sorry. And um, Anderson has done animated films before. They're just stop motion animation, which kind of surprised me that this was hand drawn. So, I, again, I, the third part was really good. Now let's talk about your favorite part, which is the first. Um, I thought it was interesting how they they enveloped it in a seminar to a certain extent, as well as, as it being like the way that the first part is done it's still an article but the article is also being presented as an artistic seminar in front of a bunch of i'm guessing intellectuals and professors so i think that was interesting and tilda swinton uh a a great actress who is kind of crazy but she's great as an actress uh she plays the part really well and her deadpan comedy is actually pretty good in this yeah, um, the first one was sort of interesting, mostly because just um, it kind of reminded me of, of sort of an art appreciation lecture, mm-hmm. um, uh, because um, during my college days and everything, I had to take an elective credit, and the only thing I could think of that sort of fit my interest was art appreciation, and when it gets into the lecture pieces with uh, Tilda Swinson's character... Uh, it just kind of reminded me um, of just being in a very engaging art appreciation lecture, and just um, what in, uh, what held my interest so much was just sort of uh, it was sort of the look uh, the look into the artist mm-hmm. um, aspect of the artwork that the story kind of went into. Just hey, you know, this is this is the inspiration for the art piece. This is this is the why behind the art piece. This is why it's so significant. And then um, interlaced into that is uh, is a story of unrequited romance as well. But um, we can dive into that more during the spoiler the spoilers right. one section of this. But there's a unrequited love story, which I thought was really interesting um, and all that. And then uh, kind of to your point about the splashes of color happening... It, it was really interesting um, in the first story because a lot of the a lot of the recounting of um, the 
artist's life and everything is done in kind of a muted, almost kind of black and whitish tones. And then when it jumps into sort of the modernish era where uh, where Tilda Swinson char- uh, her character is doing the um, I guess it's an art symposium lecture. You've got just full brightish colors. They almost look kind of maybe 60s or 70s ish. So maybe that's when this lecture is happening. So it was just kind of a nice contrast. And then, of course, you have the splashes of colors during the important pivotal scenes, like um, the reveal, the reveal of the artwork um, that happens towards the end of the story and everything. Mm. So um, the use of color. Uh, was was really neat for the first chapter and everything. So uh, I think between all all those things, that's what really just got my attention for the first story. Okay. Okay. Um, I like the first story. I like the performances. I love Leah Sado. Uh, she even in her French, like even in any film she does, she's actually she's really good. Um. I was surprised I like Benicio del Toro as much as I did. Uh, he he's an actor that when I, he first got big in Traffic, that caught a lot of people's attention, but then kind of went downhill, or kind of I think maybe stayed quiet and didn't have more splashy roles. But he actually did this role really well. He's usually an intense kind of actor, but he. He, he maintained a, a certain muted intensity while still being... Uh, it's hard to describe Wes Anderson's type of filmmaking without it coming off as kind of an insult. But it, it's... Huh. Anderson's style is kind of stilted. And I, I, I really hate saying that because... It comes off as insulting, but it, it's it's done in a deliberately paced way where it seems odd when you're watching it, but as you're watching it, it's comforting and kind, and it really works for Anderson. So, but it, I was surprised that Del Toro works so well under the framework of Anderson's uh, style. So I was again pleasantly surprised by that. Yeah. Um... Del Toro's performance was was um, really neat to see, especially since, um, in my mind, he kind of captured the the I guess um, tranquil maniac sort of uh, sort of aesthetic that they were trying to give the the artist character um, the feeling of, and it's kind of it's kind of accentuated during during the parole trial as well too. Yeah, that's true. I think mean, that's where the intensity part, I think, was ratcheted up a bit. Um, yeah, I... Before we get into spoilers, okay, why don't we talk about Wes Anderson as a filmmaker? I know you're not... I'll go into it. You're, I know you're not really... Uh, you don't know of a lot of his films. But a lot of his, his films are critically acclaimed. He has a, a, a big fan base of uh, film lovers who ad- adore his films. And I, I just have to ask you specifically, did this film make you curious as to his other films? Yeah, certainly did. Um, mostly because just uh, The French Dispatch is not a film that I would normally go out of my way for. Right. Uh, especially since just... just um, uh, I, I like action films. I like um, sci-fi films, and um, I indulge rather a lot in um, animated uh, films as well too. So um, this one being sort of more on um, on the side of a storytelling comedy was a little bit um, outside of uh, my wheelhouse, but it was kind of nice to watch as well too because um, for me it, it was just like, ah, hey, actually, you know, this is kind of neat because. Um, while this uh, this isn't uh, something that I would consider like my favorite movie or anything, I think it's still quite a uh, quite a great movie. Just um, even if it is something that is not within my normal choice of genre. If you're into animated films, I would have to recommend Fantastic Mr. Fox. Uh, let me check. Oh, it's on. Uh, let me check if it's on Netflix, real quick. But. Uh, 
Yeah, Fantastic Mr. Fox is actually a really good animated film. And if you haven't, it's on Disney Plus. Okay. Okay. So, in your leisure, if you want to see an animated film that's made by him, that's a good movie. My favorite of his is Rushmore. But I think a lot of people would say his best is either The Royal Tenenbaums or Moonrise Kingdom. So if you want to get into probably his best work, that might be where to go. But like I said, for animated films, uh, I haven't seen Isle of Dogs. I've heard that's good. But Fantastic Mr. Fox is actually a really well done movie. So are you ready to get into spoilers? Yeah, I'm good to go. Okay, we're going to get into spoilers for The French Dispatch. We'll give you five seconds, and then we'll have something on the YouTube uh, on the YouTube uh, post right there that will say that we're going into spoiler territory in five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Um, I'm surprised the framework wasn't as central Uh of a storytelling device as I expected it to be. The only reason why is because Bill Murray is in almost every film that Anderson is in, and he's usually prominent in some sort of way. And and, and the only time they use Murray in the movie was to start the movie off and then cap it and cap each story, which kind of surprised me in a bit. It's not a bad thing. But I, I was kind of surprised by it. Yeah, and I thought the start of it, uh, the start of the movie that sort of laid out the premise uh, was kind of neat too, especially since um, uh, it starts off with the whole uh, the whole matter that this is a foreign division of a um, of a publication that uh, is from Kansas. Yeah, and, and uh, the fact that um, it was uh, the only reason it came to be was um, the head. Uh, the head of the publication, um, his son wanted to travel the world, so he sort of made an excuse. And then, then the father was just like, "Yeah, sure. Um, let's let's go ahead and you know just make a branch office, and we'll just go from there." Right. And and um, to introduce the story, they have sort of a a um, introduction mini story where it talks about one of their one of their reporters who sort of bikes around. This, um, the, uh, the fictional city of Anui sur Boise and um, showing just uh, kind of how things have contrasted with past and present. Yeah. Um, and how much or how little the city had changed over time, which I thought was sort of an interesting way to set up um, the setting. Yeah. Uh, the setting and place of uh, where all these stories were going to revolve around. It introduced the, the, the city as a character. But I didn't feel that the city was exactly important in the three stories. So, it, on one hand, I kind of appreciate it and its quirkiness. But on the other hand, I kind of forgot about it as the film went on. So, yeah. because yeah. It, it didn't, the stories didn't, the stories didn't accentuate the city as much to turn it into its own character. It just was a setting, which was kind of disappointing. But yeah, that does it. It doesn't exactly hurt the film. Yeah, and um, and then pretty much after after this uh, sort of uh, mini introduction happens, um, it goes it goes back to the uh, to the publication itself that um, the head editor uh, of the French Dispatch, um, uh, Arthur uh, Arthur Howitzer, basically he dies of a heart attack and. Um, in in the stipulations of his will, he basically says that uh, upon his death, that the magazine will be completely uh, suspended and closed, but uh, the writers will um, make one final farewell issue with four articles, along with an obituary and dedication to him, and that's sort of where this premise gets set up. Yeah. Yeah, and it's... It, it, it's... The hmm, the thing about the premise that I found disappointing is that it didn't. It only hmm, it only connected itself in an arbitrary way. It was just to move the story along. It didn't have a 
how do I put this? It didn't have an overall meaning to the to the movie, except to say, this is how the structure is, this is how the story goes, this is the beginning, this is the end, that's it. There really is no other connection other than this. these are articles from a magazine. And that's kind of disappointing. But yeah. again, is it is it something that's going to in hit is going to lessen my enjoyment of the movie? No, it's not. But I I just found that a little a little disappointing. Um we talked about uh before the spoilers, we talked about the first story which is with uh Benicio del Toro, Leo Sido, Adrian Brody and a bunch of other actors. So those are the three main principal characters, the yeah, character actors. And, um, the first, the first full story is um, titled "The Concrete Masterpiece." Right, and I, I really enjoyed it. I, I kind of, hmm. I don't know about you, Zero. I, I, you don't, you don't watch as much movies as I do, so maybe you don't have this problem. Um, I'm getting kind of tired of nudity <laughs> in movies just for <laughs> nudity's sake. <laughs> like, um, if the, like, for example, the first thing you see about Leah Sado in the movie is her completely naked body, uh, yeah. doing a, an artistic pose. Now, if you want to, if you want to give off the fact that she's nude, you can frame the scene to a certain point where you don't see her bits and bobs and just be like, okay, yeah, I get it. She's a nude model. Okay, done. Cool. And then when it turns out that she's also the guard, then, you know, then you can go elsewhere with it. But I I was like, did she, did that really need to, <laughs> did you really need to have her nude again? I mean, we discussed it on, um, on our discord, uh, Blue is the Warmest Color, uh, which Leah Sido was the main star of. And she is... Well, she's not naked throughout half the film, but there is an explicit sex scene in there that's pretty long. And it... it to me, I, the, the defense I always hear is it's central to the story and it's central to the artistic vision. But when is the artistic vision just a titillate? And at this point, and maybe this is my age now, because um, I'm nearing 40, I think by this point, I'm like, I'm kind of done with just nudity for titillation's sake. So I kind of was, I hate to get hung up on this, but I was kind of like, is that really necessary? I mean, really? And, and nudity isn't something that Wes Anderson does most of the time either. If I look through his past films... Uh, I I am fairly certain that the majority of the films doesn't have any nudity, so I'm not sure why this one needed it. So there, there's there's that's my that's my feeling on that one. I'll, I'll move on from there. Yeah, um, it almost seemed like it was um, the nudity uh, was more to kind of try to set up that that Simone um, uh, Leah Sado's character um, was more to kind of set up that. Uh, she was the muse, and and then later later in the concrete masterpiece, um, there's also talks that uh, uh, Simone um, also is able to maintain uh, some just really really just strenuous poses for a long while, mm -hmm. and that they kind of show her modeling and some of the poses and everything. But even then, it it was just kind of like like. You know, after after the first couple poses, yeah, we get it. She's yeah. she's the muse, and uh, I kind of felt the same way. It's just like you know, just uh, yeah, sure. I, I'm uh, the first the first time she's uh, she's got nothing on. Okay, it's a bit of a shock because you're just like, well, holy shit, she's she's the prison uh, the prison guard overseeing this this artist. Yeah, wow, holy cow. But yeah, just when they go kind of go into oh yeah, um, by the way, just on top of being his muse. Um, she was also able to just um, uh, take up some really, really just uh, strenuous and tiresome poses without exhausting herself. It's just like, okay, well, we get it. Just 
just that's that. And, right. But yeah, we really didn't need to see like four or five poses. I mean, you could have gotten away with at least maybe one, maybe two, maybe even three at most. But um, just I guess that uh, they just really wanted to emphasize the whole uh, the whole piece that she was the muse. Yeah. Um. Overall, with that story, I, uh, I I liked it. I liked it quite a bit. I think it's interesting how a lot of the a lot of the scenes in the film are shot in a way of of an artist's rendering. Like the the final scene where the fight happened, it was done, or or when they're showing all of his pieces in different locations, they're all done in a way that looks like an artist painting. I thought that was interesting. Um, Visually, I think it's probably the best of the three, but story-wise, I think the third one's best. But it's it's a solid entry. I liked it. Yeah, um, uh, the the still scenes where kind of like they almost have what feels like a photograph of like certain pivotal moments during that story. Yeah, I thought they were sort of interesting. And then um, uh, on top of that, sometimes they would. Uh, kind of use a um, a panning camera shot that would sort of move into what seemed like the next photograph in this uh, in this like chronicling of events. I thought that was just super neat of them to sort of use that technique to kind of emphasize um, these particular moments in that particular story that seemed very important. Yeah. So let's move on to the second uh, story. I think is the weakest. And that is the political story involving Timothy Chalamet's character, who is a, uh, I think that's a college student, who also runs a political action group, and a, and the reporter played by Francis McDormand, who, right off the bat, starts a sexual relationship with him, in I think probably the most awkward way possible, and this isn't awkward by like Anderson awkward but like story-wise and setting up the premise awkward it, it just it felt kind of off to me especially when she gets right afterwards involved to say I have to maintain my journalistic integrity and that's why I kind of felt oh they're making a jab at this but it kind of doesn't yeah. work yeah so um for anyone um uh, following along and everything um, the second story uh, um, is based on, I want to say, the um, French, um, the French Revolution of '68. I think. Mm -hmm. um, I I forget offhand, but um, the title uh, of the second story is uh, "Revisions of a Manifesto." So just. Uh, when I uh, when I saw um, the uh, the little title card for the second story, I was just like, okay, interesting. This looks like this is going uh, going to be a more, much more political story, right? And, and um, granted, <clears throat> uh, politics is definitely not my forte, um, and politics in in media can sort of be hit or miss with me. So um, it was kind of one of those things when I saw the title card, I was like, okay, just um, depending on how this lands, this may or may not be great for me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in all fairness, it's not a, it's not an over. It's about politics. It's not about a politic. If you know what I'm saying, it's not about someone's politics or their thoughts and feelings about something. It's about politics in general. Like it's, yeah. a, but, but in order to. In order to really care about a subject you're talking about, you have to care about the characters to a certain extent, and I could kind of care less about any of them. Yeah, I, um, I, I know the journalist um, uh, Lucinda Kremens. Just, I, I really just, just didn't have much of an affinity for her because she just kind of came off as, as um, very cold and distant throughout the whole thing, and uh, it almost kind of felt like. Um, the cold and distant personality she had was trying to play off on the on the whole principle that she tried to carry throughout the entire story, which was the whole journalistic neutrality thing. Yeah. And 
her being cold really wasn't the issue really it just it, it, my issue was just with the the writing itself and how it was portrayed like they clear I, I i i have said it again i'll say it again. i'll say it again i think they clearly want to make a jab at political objective of of uh journalistic integrity and objectivism when it comes to politics i think they i i think anderson clearly want to say something about it and i don't think he got the message across quite well and yeah. the the way you would do that uh, in this one, I think is to poke fun at the the journalist, stating that she is uptight about her objectivism, but is getting so involved in the story that it's kind of hard for her to. It's kind of hard for her to do that, and for a character to for one of the main characters to point it out to her at the end, kind of defeats the message in a way, because I would I to me I would rather come out of it and going huh a journalist isn't really that objective is she <laughs> and and highlight maybe the the wrongness and the the hypocrisy of the character itself and come up with that and come up with that myself rather than the story tell me because it seemed like the story just could, didn't know how to end and didn't know how to do it effectively enough so it just kind of spelled it all out for you and then close to that point ended it. And I think probably a cheap way. The uh, the story ends with the main character, the boy, dying. Which I was like, okay, that does nothing. Sure. Okay then. I I don't I don't know what it did for you, but Yeah, and it's and it's kind of funny because um uh, the whole the whole trying to poke fun at um, journalistic integrity bit sort of fell apart right in the middle of the story um, after Kremens uh, ends up uh, kind of having uh, having a romantic dalliance with uh, Zeffirelli because just um, at one part he's just having trouble sort of putting together his little manifesto and everything and and she ends up sort of <clears throat> sorting it out for him and she goes yeah I sorted it out for you uh, um, I basically figured out your writing style, so, you know, just, uh, this should do it, um, and by the way, just, I just, um, also added an, an appendix because just, uh, there's just so much flowery jargon that you use, and I figured that this would help some of, uh, some of the other people in your movement to be able to kind of understand some of your flowery language and everything, and, and right then and there, it's like, wow, just... You, you built up this whole story of journalistic integrity and it just falls apart right in the middle. It's just, oh, geez, uh, this, this is, uh, this is get, uh, coming off as one of the weaker stories in the, in the movie so yeah. far. And then towards the end, just, there's also, there's also the whole love triangle thing between in, uh, Kremen Zeffirelli and Juliet. Just, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> I felt that was so forced. I, I it it, it it to me it was so obvious what they were going to that I was just like okay <laughs> I, I guess if that's where you want to go with it go ahead and yeah I, at no point where I, and, and when you when you can pretty much figure out within the first frame that this is what it was going to be it kind of deflates the story so yeah yeah so um, overall just just um the second story had um had some interesting potential but it just sort of gives up the gas really early yeah now would you call it a bad story it's not bad it's definitely weak yeah i would agree with you there i think um it's mercifully short it felt short at least i, I think the the first and the third one were much longer but yeah, it just it just felt like Anderson had an idea and it didn't really germinate the right way. So he just kind of he just kind of said, "This is my idea. Here you go." And that's it. And kind of forgot to make good characters. And there you go. I think that's what happened. 
in this one. It's short. It's not bad. It's just not as good as the other two. That, that's, yeah. that's okay. And then we'll go into the last one, which is um, I don't I don't know the I, I forget the characters' names, but Jeffrey Wright's character is a is basically doing a true crime story about yeah, a. Um, go ahead. Uh, the title of the story being uh, "The Private Dining Room of the Police Commissioner," and um, Jeffrey uh, Jeffrey Wright's character um, is named Roebuck Wright, and he's uh, and this is sort of a true crime story to recount attending a private dinner with the uh, commissaire of the Ennui police force. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just, I didn't real. <laughs> this is funny. Uh, I didn't realize that all of this was set in Ennui. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, Ennui being the city that, it's, um, that they sort of uh, set up, set up the premise in. Yeah. The, first little mini story but yeah I'll just... yeah I, I remember i just, it just i guess because it wasn't distinctive enough it kind of didn't dawn on me until we were discussing it like oh wait <laughs> interesting but um yeah um this is the strongest story of the three for me and it, it may have to do, do with maybe i'm more interested in true crime than art but the the main journalistic character just with um just with Jeffrey Wright alone, I think trumps all three characters that were the main journalists in the uh, in the story. So, right there, you have a definite plus in Jeffrey Wright, um, and just just Wright's delivery, not only in the in the uh, the framework scene where he's on a talk show with Leah Schreiber and talking about the the story verbatim that he wrote. Uh, years ago, but uh, the way he acted as well, the way he he fits so well in a Wes Anderson film. I want to see him again in a Wes Anderson film. Is what I'm saying because he is fantastic in this in the scene. Yeah. He owns he owns the story. He owns this performance, which again can't praise enough. It's it's such a good performance. Oh yeah, and um. And just sort of the depiction of just a very, very confident, um, co uh, confident reporter that has just kind of a tack sharp memory being on this TV show interview. Mm -hmm. I just thought it, uh, he just sort of played that role with uh, the bravado and confidence of like an ace reporter. Yes, absolutely. Um, not only an ace reporter, but a fantastic writer, which would they, which they. They show in a scene where uh, Bill Murray's character meets him in a jail. I think they kind of uh, they show how much of a good reporter or a good writer he is, because he is willing to, I guess, front his front the money to get him out in order to in order to get his services. So I thought yeah. that was interesting. Um, the the overall crime story is is good. It's fun in a way, especially with how they how the details run in it. And then you mentioned the animated se sequence in the in the uh, in this section, which could have felt odd, but actually worked really well in the end of the story. So it's something that I, I don't want to spoil too much because it really, to me, it's really the best part of the movie. But I. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed this part. After coming off of the second part where I was thinking, oh, this might fall apart. And it, it thankfully didn't because the third one was so good. Yeah, and and just overall, um, I just this one, like you mentioned, it's just a lot of fun. As, uh, especially the police chase at the end. And that's where just the integration with the animation comes in. Uh, because just when it hits you, um, just on the initial viewing, it was just kind of a shock because just, at least for me, I was watching the whole thing going, okay, well, you know, this uh, this seems to have been a live-action affair, probably just going to be a typical live-action movie chase because, you know, that's, um, that's just how most live-action movies are. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, it just kind of clips over to an animation sequence and... And much like your initial assess assessment, where you're just like, "Oh dear, they they probably ran out of money." Here we go. And <clears throat> instead of just 
kind of low quality animation it's very very high quality and very fluid to boot right it remind like, it reminded me of uh not not directly because i know someone's going to hear this if you're like huh but uh it reminded me of the adventures of priz Ahmed, which is a 1930s animated film that was animated by animators who were printing on the cells of the uh of the actual film print, it looks it looks gorgeous. It, it reminded me of that. It's not necessarily that style. It's not that style at all, but it kind of reminded me of that in a way. Um, but yeah, it, it. The more I think about it, with Wes Anderson, it makes sense because Wes Anderson, when he does action sequences, they come off corny in a purpose a purpose way, like on purpose, I should say. But. So, but I, if they did that in this scene, I don't think it would have worked very well. So, I, I I think this was the right move, and it worked out well. So, yeah. Uh, the the performance by Stephen Park as um, Chef Nescafier. <laughs> okay. Uh, I thought that was real fun. Yeah. Especially just sort of um, the buildup of yeah, he just he's this super masterful chef, but on top of being a masterful chef, just um, he's skilled more in in haute cuisine and um on top of being just very skilled in haute cuisine just uh he kind of uh, makes the cuisine also palatable to to the working police officer as well too so it was just kind of this this depiction of a super chef that can make both delicious food but also food that's understandable to the average working man yeah um so that depiction was just kind of fun, especially just with all the fire and flair that they sort of add to the scenes where you see Chef Nescafe uh, making uh, making food and everything. So that was that was a lot of fun, uh, and it, it it's kind of interesting too because um, towards the end of this story they sort of um, cut back to to the French dispatches um, office and mm -hmm. head editor. Uh, basically says you know you only gave nescafe one line in your entire article <laughs> yeah and you know just he's he's supposed to be one of the more pivotal people in your story why and and then of course um robux just like well i had something but i decided to throw it away because i didn't really think it fit the story so um Houcher just tells him yeah, I, I still want to see it anyways. Yeah, and then it loops back into the story again, um, just just uh, with uh, Nescafe just um, telling telling Wright that you know just just um, uh, while uh, while he tasted uh, the poison food and everything, um, the the taste was so splendid, like something he had never ever uh, had before in his life. But at the same time, um, sort of commiserate, uh, he commiserates with Robux saying, you know, just, just, uh, the taste also kind of reminds, uh, reminds him just, uh, how much just, um, uh, non-French foreigners, um, sort of feel in France that they just, uh, they just feel sort of, um, uh, disconnected, uh, because just, they they aren't seen as um, as just normal people in the citizenry because they are foreign to France. Yeah, yeah, it was a good scene. This one kind of ties into to the um, last story, the obituary scene. Um, it's kind of interesting, uh, just just how this uh, this whole movie sort of culminated, especially when it gets to the obituary scene and. Uh, a Houser has just died, and he's just being examined by, I'm presuming, the medical examiner and everything. And so, just the entire newsroom is sort of culminated together in the office, sort of trying to figure out, okay, so we we've got our stories now. Um, how do we organize it, and 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 who's going to have the honor of writing the obituary and everything, and. Uh, after just a bit of discussion, uh, Robuck ends up suggesting, "Hey, you know, um, since we all had a hand in 
in this in this uh, publication office, how about we all sort of um, cooperate in the spirit of camaraderie and and write the obituary together and everything. And mm. um, it was uh, it was a kind of a neat way to close out the story. Yeah, uh, because it was just uh, it was just kind of like. Um, their way of uh, giving giving the publication the final hurrah, especially uh, when you remember in the beginning of, of the movie, they sort of set up the premise that on um, Hauser's death, the journal uh, the journal uh, publication would be closing after they put out their final issue. Mm -hmm. So uh, it felt like a sort of just um, seeing a much beloved publication sort of. Um, shuttering its doors so for me there was a little bit of sadness um because uh i've had a few publications um uh, in paper magazines shut down just due to things like low budget and stuff like that so it felt like this entertaining this entertaining um, journal that i'd been reading for the entirety of the movie was just um putting a stamp on the final issue and just um that would be the only issue to, to, I guess, send the legacy of, of the magazine off. So uh, overall, it um, it was a neat way to close the movie out. And overall, it just felt like just a really, really good read through through something like a very engaging copy of The New Yorker or something. Yeah. So uh, I would probably still recommend this to anyone who, who may not. Um, you may not think that this may uh, be in their interest because uh, it may be something that uh, that might end up on um, on a person's radar in the future and everything. Because just for me, I went into this being completely blind to um, Wes Anderson's work. So for me, I would probably give this a high recommendation, mostly because. Yeah, it was just a fun watch, and even if it wasn't in my normal genre. Okay. And your normal genre is uh, just just so everyone knows. What, what's your normal genre of films that you enjoy? Um, action, sci-fi, and um, maybe uh, psychological thrillers. Okay. Uh, you gravitate a lot towards Asian cinema, though, don't you? Yeah, uh, Asian cinema is definitely where where most of my taste is but okay um, i still enjoy some of the stuff done by uh, by the western side of the world yeah okay you know, dirty americans yeah <laughs> um my final thoughts in the film basically uh, as someone who's been a fan of wes anderson uh since rushmore in 1990 was it seven? Oh my god um it's a very good film. It's I would say it's a great film. Does it reach the heights of his best films? No. It kind of it like like we mentioned in the second part. It kind of falls apart. But I'm not gonna dock it too much, but because of that, because the that seems quick, and it, it gets through at a brisk pace, and you forget about it by the time the third part rolls. So. I really enjoy the film. It's got the usual panache that that Anderson has. It's fun. It's funny in, in certain spots, and it really has that distinct, like like you mentioned, that distinct feel that you're reading or you're watching uh, a reading of a, a New Yorker magazine to a certain extent. So I I definitely enjoyed it. And I would rec I would definitely if you're a Wes Anderson film fan I would recommend it. If you're not, um, I don't know. I I'd say give it a shot, but it, it's definitely the, the way that they mention they call the, the main thing they call uh, Anderson is Twee, and I, I really hate calling him Twee because everyone calls him Twee, but it's it's an apt description. So. If you don't mind kind of corny but really beautiful looking set design and colors, I would say give it a shot. But otherwise, if you're a film fan, if you're a fan or a film fan in general of uh, Wes Anderson, I'd recommend it. It's a it's a great film. Now, before we get to what our next film is, Zero, I have a question for you. 
Okay. Uh, for those of us that, for those of you who don't listen to our games podcast uh, called uh, Game Watch or Zero and Wizards Game Watch, every episode I have a question for Zero for him to answer, mainly because Zero hasn't come up with a question for me, and he answers it because I like to torture him. Zero, about a week ago, I gave you a link to a trailer. Do you remember what the trailer was for? Oh, goodness. It's it's been a while. <laughs> okay, the trailers for Weird Al Yankovic's new movie called Weird: The Al Yankovic Story. Yeah, yeah. Okay, did you watch the trailer? It was a minute long. Yeah, I did. Okay, what did you think of the trailer? And what did you think? And would this be a movie you would give a chance to to watch? Um, the trailer is definitely interesting. As far as if I would watch it, more than likely I would because um I do quite like. Weird Al, uh, Weird Al Yankovic, um, especially just uh, because uh, some of his songs have been just absolutely hilarious, especially uh, just being um, interesting, I guess you could say, interesting satires on society and the world at large. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I definitely uh, uh, watch it when whenever this gets available to like streaming services and things like that. I first watched it, and I was kind of shocked that Daniel Radcliffe did not sound like Weird Al at all. And I mean at all. <laughs> I was like I watched it twice and I was like, he's not even trying, is he? And, a minute, and for the minute I was like, oh, this is a cash-in. Oh no. But then I thought about it. I was like, wait a minute. This is kind of exactly what Weird Al would want. Because it's, it's probably my hope is that this is a movie that lampoons biopics like say walk hard and makes fun of the genre while talking about weird owls uh weird owls life when he was popular so if that's the case i'm kind of in on it because i'm like if that's the case they're just gonna lampoon and not take it seriously make fun of things and go crazy with it then i'm like okay that that's fine i'll i'm there but my first thought was "Ooh, this looks like trash uh, but then when I thought, I was like, well, wait a minute, this might work. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I definitely sort of had the vibe of, OK, this has the feel of it uh, being called in. But I think this is sort of sort of like the satirical feel that that we're uh, Weird Al's going for. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I think this is going to work out, even if um, Daniel Radcliffe's performance definitely seems like it's phoned in. He, he still has a British accent. <laughs> That's the thing that was yeah. like, wait a minute. <laughs> he doesn't he doesn't sound British? What is this? <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, um I'm looking forward to it. So I'm I'm definitely gonna watch it. Alright, Zero. It is your turn to tell us what we're watching for the next episode. Now if you out there are listening and you want to you want to recommend something, hit a comment on our uh, video and comment on what you think we should listen to. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube to and to find out if you're going to get more of our videos. But anyway, yeah, if you have a recommendation of what you think we should watch, let us know. Uh, we do reserve the right to say no, by the way. But yeah, go ahead, Zero. What are we watching now? So, um, my next recommendation is a Wong Kar Wai film. Mm. Um, his most, uh, one of his most recent works uh, from 2013 called The Grandmaster. Okay. And it's a biopic on uh, Bruce Lee's teacher, Ip Man. So, uh, if, you, if you kind of know this, um, the legend and mythology of Ip Man, just um, unfortunately... There are some accounts that are highly exaggerated, and then there's some some accounts that no one can really verify, and unfortunately, that's just kind of uh, kind of the um, culture and mythology around uh, surrounding Itmon. So, uh, and this biopic is definitely hyper stylized. So, uh, uh, and it sort of takes creative liberty with blending. Um, myth and truth together so definitely definitely be sort of prepared for 
uh, for some things that you're probably going to see in the movie, just like, yeah, no way. There's no way this actually happened. <laughs> okay. 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 So yeah. if you want to watch it with us, uh, it looks like the Grandmaster. Uh, could you get this on YouTube or could you, or is it just on um, Amazon? It's, it's, on, it's on several storefronts. Okay. Um, the HD copy is going for about um, eight um, eight US dollars online to buy it outright, and then it's about four dollars um, online to rent it on okay. a video platforms such as Amazon Prime Video and um, the Google Play um, Movie and TV Store. Okay, so if you want to watch with us and comment on the video when the review comes out, just go ahead and join us. So on that note. We are going to end this episode. Uh, thank you for listening. Tune in next time for the next episode. We're going to talk about Wong Kar Wai's The Grand Master. I am The Wiz. And I'm Zero. And we'll talk to you next time.